Welcome back, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about landscape photography. Um, as the title of the, the uh, video implies, um, this is an image taken from um, a place where I vacation in Italy. Um, there's some friends of mine, and I've been going there since I've been about 19. So um, this this is from the balcony of their the room I stay in at their house, and it actually means a lot to me. And it's in Geneva, Italy. Um, and I've this this image um, of this view brings back lots of memories. Like I mean, and I think landscapes in general, um, they they elicit and bring back a lot of imageries or mem memories. And um, I think that's one of the reasons they're one of the most popular photos on social media. Um, the the environments we're in that we happen to be situated in. I mean, who hasn't seen or taken a video um, or taken a photo of themselves and either photographed a beautiful scenic background behind you and landscape behind you, um, or just taken a like a video of yourself and then quickly panned. To the sunset or the background or the tropical paradise that you happen to be situated in I think we've all done that and so what we're doing is we're showing showing these gorgeous environments and settings that we happen to be in um, which are a large part of our lived experience right is where we are um, yeah so I mean this um, these lectures today and these sort of tutorials we're going to cover um, are going to help us better like compose our photos um, and situate them and arrange the elements in them, how to frame them. Um, and also we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of finding the light because light is everything. Um, as you'll see in this photo right here, I mean, light represents like, like the mood we feel, right? And the vibe and the whole energy of the scene um, is dictated by the light. So, um, it's super important to not only arrange your photos in a pleasing manner and sort of in a way that you find sort of pleasing, but also to, um, to remember the importance of the light itself, right? And how that affects landscapes. I know we've talked about a little bit how it affects objects and objects and people and food and other things like that. But in landscapes, um, light is, light is incredibly important, right? I mean, more important than we probably think. Um, in addition, we're going to talk about some post-production techniques um, that will help your camera like better replicate what your eye sees. How many of you guys have gone and photographed something or looked at something and been part of an experience and then looked at something and then were like, dude, that's not even, that, gosh, this does not look like what I saw. This doesn't replicate what my eye saw. And there are several reasons for that. And we're going to cover a couple of how we can better approximate what our eye sees. Um, when we're in an environment in a landscape and thereby better um, better preserving that memory for us to like to have, right? I mean, nobody wants to have a photo of something they that doesn't look like what they saw. So that's the st stuff we're going to talk about a little bit. Again, this is Geneva, Italy, and this is looking over uh, the sea next to them. I think you could almost see Corsica, I think, in the distance on a clear day. Um, yeah, I just love the light and how it made the water green and the patches of light and how the, the shadows and light, right, um, replicated the, the sky right there. And again, this is my view, so I'm a little bit spoiled when I go there, and um, I just geek out on this flipping, uh, this, like, uh, shot every time I go there, right? Um, this is also in Italy. This is near the Cinque Terre. They're called the Five Lands. And again, you can see... Um, yeah, I like how the, the image is set up and formed, but I'm most concerned with the light. Love the light breaking through the clouds. This does this all the time in Italy on the coast. Um, no matter when you go, um, uh, like clouds and stuff roll in and they provide this really beautiful, like you can see light rays and stuff and light hitting the surface of the water back there. I find it just like so fun to photograph this kind of stuff. And again, y'all, I'm not a landscape photographer. Um, I'm a people photographer, right? So I don't usually like... Um, I don't usually like photographing landscapes. This is something I've started to do as I've traveled. Um, and I just really enjoy, I sort of enjoy it now, but I'm not, it's not something I'm great at or I'll have to confess or super good at, but it is something I really enjoy. Right. So, um, this is a trip that I just took to Scotland this last year. And 
and um, really enjoy the light. And we were on this like um, this boat traveling from, I think we're, I don't even, gosh, I don't know, we're heading to Isle of Sky somewhere. We're, we're heading somewhere. So um, yeah, anyway, we're on this boat and everybody's photographing themselves. And I thought it was really funny because everybody's got like the wind in their hair and they're photographing their face on the boat. Totally get that's an interesting memory um, and super fun to take. But I think the majority of the people on the boat um, spent the entire like 30 minute little trip photographing themselves. And, and I did too. I mean, completely confessing right now. I totally did too. I took a sat there and took a picture of myself and was like, Oh my God, look where I am. This is so fun. Um, whatever. But then I got, I saw this and saw this patch of light that was on the left side of the lighthouse. And as we, the boat was moving, the light was, um, sort of drifting. The clouds were drifting over and the boat was moving. So, it positioned, I waited and, and saw this that was about to happen. And I thought, how cool would it be if this light was just literally light, right behind the lighthouse, right? And in the background, and it still, you know, made it stand out. So again, you guys, I mean, yeah, uh, a lot of landscape photography is going to be when you're traveling, right? And you're going to new locations and want to preserve the stuff you see. This to me is a fantastic memory. It brings back the cold of the boat. The trip was, um, my wife was freezing. Um, and I sat here and watched this and waited and waited for this to happen. And it finally, we, um, the boat came to a position where, um, yeah, it turned us and put this light right behind this lighthouse. One of my favorite photos, you guys, of my trip to Scotland. I mean, despite all the other stuff I shot, um, this is one of my favorite photos, right? And this was shot on iPhone, I think 15 or something and edited in Lightroom. Um, this is a Highland Coup. They're called. They're called coos, I guess. I thought it was a Highland cow, and I was corrected by Scottish people every time I said it wrong. And um, yeah, so I snuck out on the looks like the tundra here, right? I crept out on the tundra and saw these flowers and stuff, and liked the cow, and realized it wasn't. Um, I didn't think it was going to rush me just yet, so I grabbed this shot real quick, and then and then ran. Yeah, I ran back to my car, um, because there's calves back there, right? All those little, all those little tiny little, uh, fluffy little bunny looking things that are light tan. Those are all the cows, and these are all the moms. And what you may not realize is the Highland coos have, uh, I, even the female ones have horns. So I think this 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 could possibly be a mother, and the mothers when they have ca the ca when they calf like this, um, become a little bit aggressive and. Yeah, I don't want to be one of those, I think they call them Turons, right? Where you're a moron, it's a moron crossed with a tourist. And usually it happens, you see those in like Yellowstone and stuff, where people are getting gored by a bison or, you know, run over by a moose or something. And they make it, they go viral because they're idiots. Yeah, well, this is almost, almost to the point where um, I was on the edge. Let's just say I was on the edge of being a Turon, Okay. So, um, but I respect, I was pretty respectful. I tried to stay back. I didn't go near the calves. For those of you who want to know, um, I stayed really far back and didn't get a picture of the babies because I felt like that would really piss the, uh, the moms off. So yeah, um, this is a little place and I'm sure you guys are going to be like sick of seeing my Scottish photos, but honestly, you guys, I mean, in terms of landscape photography myself, these represent a lot of what I've been doing lately. And the, almost the only times I shoot this kind of stuff is, is when I travel, right? So you're going to see some travel photos from this last summer. Um, this is a little, God, I cannot remember this freaking island and I'm not going to look it up. So sorry. It's a little island. If you guys want to know, you can email me. Anyway, the, the only thing on it is this little monastery. And it, I mean, it is sort of interesting and the, the trip out here was fun. Um, but I, this is half this shot here, there's a lot of lines going on, but there's also framing. And we talked about like a frame within a frame and composition. That's literally one of the things we do in landscape photography a lot is frame stuff. And you'll see that the monastery is framed in the space between the top uh, branches, right? And the leaves up there and the gate below. And I also put a small vignette on it in Lightroom to darken the areas around, right? To focus our eye more on the light part of the object part of the scene, which is the, the monastery itself and this guy. Um, this right here, you guys, is the 
I don't even know. I think this is just a reflection before I got to the Highland Coup. And I liked it because I, I love the reflections and stuff happening. I shot this ultra wide angle. As you can see, it stretches toward me and I got real low so I could get the sky and the reflection. I do shoot a lot of reflections of skies, especially you guys when they're epic skies. And that's one of the great things right now in the... What is this? Well, right now, in when it's winter, right? In winter, we generally have better skies up in the nor Northern California than... Um, than we do in the summer. In the summer, they're generally featureless and just sort of slate gray, bland, very vanilla. Um, in the winter, since we get storms and stuff, they tend to look really nice and have like clouds and therefore depth, right? They have lights and darks in them. Uh, the light clouds and the dark skies. So they tend to look a little more dramatic in the winter. And so it's, I think it's a little better time to shoot as always in the winter up in Northern California. Um, this is a, uh, a, shot, a landscape shot, right? And you'd be like, well, the, the mountains aren't in focus, and that's I did that for a reason because I was trying to focus on a center of interest, right? And a lot of times in landscape photography, it's not just photographing mountains in the background or a sunset. It's also about finding a center of interest and focusing on that center of interest and having the landscape behind you, right? So here are the flowers are the center of interest, and what I did is I used contrast to make the flowers pop out, right? So they're light against the dark of the mountainside right there, the shade of it. And they're also set up in a rule of thirds pattern, which we talked about in our composition uh, module. Here, this is um, another shot I did, you guys. Again, focusing on like sunset. This is just as the sun's dipped down. And I think the only thing I captured was the sunlight in the water itself. Um, this is in Alaska. Uh, really enjoyed the trip over there. And um, yeah, again, I'm out. This is with a, a, a lesser iPhone, I guess we'd call it. Like I think an iPhone 8 or something. Um, which had a little bit of a less, uh, I think the sensor was a little smaller and it just didn't have as great a capability to capture as the, the 15 does now. Um, you'll even notice some splotchy right purple or some splotchy purple sort of marks in the bottom right where I think um, the camera had a hard time processing some of the colors. Um, and these days, you guys, I mean, there's, dude, uh, yeah, I, the cameras these days and the phones and everywhere else usually don't reproduce that kind of stuff. So... Um, you guys shouldn't have any kinds of errors like that. This again is Scotland. Uh, this is the Isle of Skye and I toned this a little bit because I was sort of going for a complementary color scheme and noticed that the boat was orange and the sky was sort of teal blue and like in the color module th those colors are across from each other on the color wheel and therefore complementary, right? And what we know about complementary colors is they usually pop off of each other. Orange against teal will pop off, yellow against purple will sort of stand out, and those are, the, those are the colors we're sort of looking for when we when we set uh, anything like that up. And that's why I color graded a little bit like this. Um, also like the negative space, literally the boat's the only subject. It's sort of lonely and isolated in the, in the water. Um, I just wish the water were up and it wasn't like low tide. So you see all the, all the flipping dirt and like, that's not dirt. I guess it's like, um, what are those called? Uh, kelp or seaweed, right? All that seaweed in the foreground, not a fan. I really wish that were water. So yeah, should come back next time. This, you guys, is up near the cat. What are those called? The stole. Anyway, there are these mountain peak crags. Old man, the they're called old man and the the, the stole. I, I think, and um, there are these crags on the Isle of Skye that everybody climbs. And dude, it was like I feel like we walked 3.8 miles straight up. And I was literally low key like getting ready to die. Most people, dude, it's rough. It's rough. If you ever go to Scotland and hike the old man in the stole, these crags on the Isle of Skye. Uh, yeah, let me know and tell me how freaking rough it was. It's, it is like it is a brutal climb. It says intermediate or moderate on the sign when you first start, and that is a hundred percent lie. It is. It is. It is advanced as you can get. Swear to God, my calves, my quads were about ready to just, they were just noodles, right? This here, my wife hates the fact that she loves landscape photography. I'm not, a, again, I'm not, that's not my jam. Um, I photograph people. And so generally she will wait until people leave a scene and, or try to edit them out and delete them and remove them with Photoshop because she doesn't like people in her landscapes. I, on the other hand, a lot of times like people in my landscapes. 
I like people in my landscapes, you guys, because they they give like a sense of scale. Like, look how freaking big this is, right? Look how big these mountains are. You can tell because that dude is super small in comparison. So I do like a sense of scale when I photograph. So not I'm not talking hundreds of people in a shot to make it look like, you know, there's just everybody there. But like one person or two people, um, you know, uh, I think it provides a sense of scale, makes things look really big. This again is on the, oh, uh, this is on the mainland of Scotland. And uh, just, yeah, dude, everything there looks amazing. Again, this is a, 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 a find of center of interest piece, right? The, the center of interest um, are these fluffy little things in the bogs, these little flowers, these bog flowers. Can't remember what they're called, but they look like little tufts of cotton to me. And they actually resemble, I thought they resembled the clouds. So to me, this is sort of a repeating pattern um, composition type thing. And um, yeah, and I, it looks, so I thought it sort of mirrored the, the texture of the clouds, and so I just liked it. Again, castles, leading lines, framing, castles framed on the top branch of the tree and then the fence itself, right? And this, you guys, honestly, swear to God, not going to lie, the grass itself was probably my favorite photo. Just the grass. I liked the grass because it was overcast a lot there when we were there. Um, we were there in May and June. And um, the light was so freaking soft. I felt like if you reached out and touched this grass, it would be like super soft. So I literally jumped out and could not stand it because uh, the light on here. Again, the light, you guys, was so beautiful, I thought. Um, it just made everything, it made everything work for me, right? And it, so look, of course, here we go, right? I'm shooting more grass, right? Literally grass. And the reason um, I just sort of like the leading lines down, right down this sort of center composition, right? The the subject are these lines that go right out to the water. And the, um, yeah, and it, they're leading lines leading right out to the water, right? And what's cool is the clouds sort of a little bit do that too on the top. They sort of point downwards to the center of the shot. So, love this, right? Um yeah, I know, dude, right? But see, here's the thing, too. I'm not a big fan, honestly, you guys, of shooting vertical uh, vertical orientation or portrait orientation landscapes. Okay, yeah, I like this, whatever, but I like this better. I just wish it were more green, right? So, um, I mean, the light changed. It went soft here and then came out a little bit here, and you can see the light got more, like, on, on top of the grass. And then here I do it again. God, the freaking light, right? This light is coming out and just out there in the the ocean. Ocean? Is that the ocean? Maybe. I don't even know. Out there in the water. Out there in the seawater, the body of seawater. Um, it's, dude, you can see a little light patch, right? The light's blowing through there, and then it comes and spreads onto the grass, too, and just looks amazing. Love it. So one thing I want to mention, you guys, is what I do in um, when I shoot, and you guys should do this, too, if you aren't already, most of your cameras now have a RAW option. And if you look at the top left corner, um, it says R-A-W, RAW. What RAW is, it's like when you cook and you have all the ingredients, okay? So what it is, is it, between, the difference between a JPEG and a RAW file is a RAW um, file has all the ingredients and a JPEG is baked, it's already cooked. So what your camera is giving you when you shoot a RAW file is all the information. Every piece of information it's collecting, it's collecting it all for you, and then it's gonna let you apply and edit that. And in the editing process, you're basically applying your own recipe to the ingredients. And then after you apply the ingredients and you save it from Lightroom, that RAW file plus your recipe turns into a JPEG when you save it. And the JPEG is baked. Most people, most photographers, you guys, don't edit a JPEG ever. And the reason is, is because most cameras, most editing platforms, most everything considers a JPEG a final file. It's done. Right? So that's the difference between a RAW and a JPEG. A, a RAW and a JPEG file. JPEG, your camera applies the edits for you and stuff and does it sort of for you. The RAW file gives you the power um, to over the ingredients and how you want to cook it yourself or what recipe or what editing recipe you want to apply. Um, if you look at this, I couldn't even save this to my freaking drive, uh, the raw file, because it was 69 meg. And it presents itself, it says image 8049.dng. 
DNG stands for digital negative. Okay? So just like back in the days when we shot negatives with film, we'd take the negative, that was the raw file, and then we'd print it, and when we printed it, that would be our editing process, and then we'd get our, our print, that would be our JPEG. You don't usually take a photo, a, print, a printed photo, and then try to edit again, or develop it again, you can't. So that's why they sort of named this a digital negative, a DNG, is because they're referring back to like the film days when you used a, when you used a negative uh, and you developed it, okay? So a raw file is like a negative that you're gonna, you need to develop still. You need to apply um, editing stuff to it, right? Or an editing recipe. And you'll see from the left to the right, the left one looks a little bland and blah. That's because no recipe has been applied to the image yet. And on the right one, it has more contrast, the, the um, same exact image, the, um, what do you call it? The grass looks greener a little bit, looks a little brighter, there's more contrast, um, it looks a little more rich. That's because I applied an edit to it, right? And that's the whole, that's the whole thing about it, right? So if I were you guys, from now on, to be able to edit a file, people, whatever, upload them, do whatever you want, right? But if you're gonna shoot a really big file and you want the power to edit it and make it look really good, and not fall apart and break apart and be a worthless JPEG, change your camera settings to RAW in your, in your settings and photograph a RAW file and then edit that in Lightroom. And you'll see there's a dramatic difference in what you can do to the file and how much you can process it. This is a file I shot and before, this is a file I shot with my, my, my professional camera, right? And this is at Mount Tam in uh, sort of the east, northeast, would be Northeast Bay area. And um, this is, I think this is seven different images stacked on top of each other and then merged and combined. The reason I did that is because our eyes generally, our eyes have in this insane amount of dynamic range, it's called, and our cameras don't. So our camera can generally take a picture of the sky and that looks great, and you see loads of detail in that, or, and then, the, and then the, the land is dark, or it can take a picture of the land, and you'll see loads of detail in that, and then the sky is completely wiped out, completely white. That's because our cameras have a very limited dynamic range. And a dy dynamic range um, is sort of important to know, right? It refers to the range of tones in a scene, from the darkest, blackest shadows, to the brightest, most brilliant highlights. The more tonal range present in the scene, the greater the dynamic range. The best digital cameras capture only half as much range as the human eye. You ever wondered why when you've gone out to photograph a sunset or something or some great landscape you see and you're literally, you're just sitting there and enjoying it and it's like, God, this is such a vibe. I'm gonna go photograph, I'm gonna photograph this so I remember it and or I'm gonna share it with my friends because I want them to see how flippin' awesome this is and then you go to share it, you photograph it, and then you're like, huh, this doesn't look like how I sort of saw it, right? And then you start going through like different filters, and you're like, dude, God, it's gotta be a filter. Maybe there's a filter that works that makes this look like how I saw it. Uh-uh, filters, filters will enhance it, but the problem is your camera cannot, cannot like generally capture the dynamic range that your eye can. They just are not built yet, literally. So when we talk about high dynamic range or HDR, if you ever wondered why that little HDR thing came up on your phone, um, what that refers to is high dynamic range. And what your camera's doing is it's tripping into this mode to try to help figure out how to capture the brightest parts of the scene and the darkest parts of the scene, just like your eye would, right? So the dynamic, the higher dynamic range your camera has, the closer the photo will compare to what you, the eye can see, right? This, you'll, this means that you'll be able to capture more details in the shadows that might otherwise appear pure black, and you'll also be able to see details in the highlights that otherwise will be washed out and completely wiped out and overexposed. So this HDR setting on your camera and phone attempts to capture a greater range of these, tone, of these tones, but remember your eye has more dynamic range than any camera, so it's impossible to capture what you see. We're gonna try to see if we can fix that. So 
I, you can't talk about landscape photography unless you talk about Ansel Adams first. And uh, he shot this huge camera, walked around Yosemite, um, was super influential in getting Yosemite almost single-handedly designated as a national park because he sent his photos that were epic landscape photos of Yosemite, sent them to Congress. Congress is like, oh my God, these are amazing. How we have to protect these. Let's pass some legislation to make it that Yosemite is never, um, you know, uh, developed or logged or anything because it is so beautiful. Thanks Ansel Adams for showing us, you know, these photos. Well, Ansel Adams, he didn't actually, when he took the photos, they never look like what they look like in real life. He actually edited them a ton when he, when he printed them, okay, or his printer, his printer edited them when they printed them. And what Ansel Adams tried to do was he tried to make sure that all 10, all 10 uh, zones or 10 tones, he called them in his, what is known as the zone system that he invented. He wanted to make sure that there was pure black in the photo all the way to pure white, everything, right? And he thought that meant that it would have this really great dynamic range, okay? Because it's literally capturing everything. And Film does still have a, an insane amount of dynamic range and able to capture a lot of stuff that digital, I think, is still is still challenged with. Okay, especially the large, medium and large format camera, film cameras. So this is Ansel Adams. This is not Ansel Adams' work. This is a photo from a dude who's trying to replicate sort of Ansel Adams' system. And you'll see he's got the zone system up there printed at the top. You have zero, which is pure black, and you have all the way almost a pure white blown out with his, which is 10, and he doesn't have that. But he's got a lot of nine and a lot of eight and a lot of three and a lot of one and zero. But he actually doesn't have all the tonal ranges represented, right? But he tried, and I think he did a pretty good job. And here's Ansel Adams' work. These are some of the images he sent to Congress, right? And again, when he got this negative, his printer got this negative, he burned and dodged, meaning he darkened areas and he lightened areas. Um, so it would look more dramatic and more amazing, right? Same. Beautiful flipping images, right? But mo a lot of the magic, I'll have to say, happened in the dark room when the printer was printing these and burning, uh, darkening areas and lightening areas, uh, burning and dodging, right? Um, when he made the prints. Now, Roman Laurent is a photographer based in the Central Valley, California, and he's exhibited all over the world and has, I think, galleries in Carmel and a couple, and maybe Santa Barbara, a couple other places. And he's after the, the traditional way of landscape photography, right? Where um, it's black and white, uh, lots of tonal ranges are, are, are there, um, beautiful work, always nature. I mean... You know, his landscape is, they're beautiful, right? This is the Central Valley. If any of you have ever been there, I think this is out by Knight's Ferry, um, uh, out towards Orange Blossom Way. This is literally on the way, on, on I think it's on Orange Blossom itself, on the left-hand side. Yeah, I know because I, w I know where exactly where this is, where this print was, because I saw this print hanging in a gallery in downtown Modesto, and I was going to buy it, and it was like $10,000. And I was like, nope, not buying it. And then I thought, hell, I'll go out and shoot it myself. So I went and drove all over and found it, photographed it, and mine looked nothing like his. Yeah, I was so depressed, um, and I realized his printer is like a flippin' wizard. Like, literally a wizard in the dark room. And did all this stuff, bur burned the sky down. I mean, it, this had taken me... I tried for two weeks to print like this, and I could not get this to print right. So, yeah. Anyway, Roman Laurent, great landscape photographer. A lot of times minimalist. This is Nicholas... Uh, rivals and he uh, these are you guys more contemporary landscape photographers who do are turning the tide a little bit on landscape photography with different applications and doing some different stuff uh, and Nicholas uses this these um, lights and puts them everywhere in his landscapes and I actually think they look pretty interesting I mean I've never really thought of lighting up a landscape with artificial light uh, I just you you know just use the sun uh, like most photographers and I sort of follow the traditional route and it was like okay I'm just gonna use the when the sun's out I'll shoot and when it's dark I'll shoot the stars but I never thought of lighting stuff 
And this guy has added some light to his things, and I think it actually has sort of a, a really interesting effect. I mean, at least it's new, and a lot of people haven't seen this before. So um, he's really doing some different stuff with his landscapes, you know, by adding these secret little lights all over the place. Will I do this? Probably not. I mean, it looks a little bit... I don't Not that I'm against sci-fi, but it just looks a little bit... I don't know. I, I think I like the landscapes without artificial light in them. I think they look... I think, they're, I think they look fine on their own. But I do appreciate his... Um, the spirit of, like, trying to change stuff and push the boundaries and try to do different things, right? I really appreciate that a ton. And I, and I love his compositions. I love his light. And these slow exposures are, are killing me. Love them. James Smart, you guys. Man, he shoots storm photography. And if I'd ever want to do a landscape photography or shoot some type of landscape photography um, that I'd really love, it'd be storm photography. And the reason I love it is because it's dangerous. And this right here makes me feel a rush. Like, I literally get a rush seeing these photos of storms. Um... He travels to the uh, U.S. all the time and, like, can't... I don't know where he goes. It's always, like, the Midwest states, you know, where you hear about all the... God, where everybody gets, like, wiped out. Like, where... Anywhere there are states where they're constantly getting hit by tornadoes and stuff, that's where that dude is, and he's traveling there and photographing these amazing flipping storms. And I just cannot get over how gorgeous the light is. I can't... I mean, these look so powerful, and I would love to be, like not near here to be damaged and like to die or you know get like stuck in the, these dang things but i'd love to photograph them from afar like really far away right i mean but look at this this dude's not far away i mean he's i don't know how close he is but this is probably too close for me but i mean just the sheer magnitude of these storms um you guys saw if you um you'll see mike oblinsky a little um time lapse video he put together of storms um, he's a videographer, and his stuff is flipping nuts. Like, it is absolutely, um, in my generation, we'd say off the hook, and it is off the hook. Like, it's amazing, right? Randy Scott Slavin, he goes a little farther than um, some people and started warping his photos and making them look sort of interesting, right? And I think these are fantastic landscape photos. I think there's a, a huge center of interest. They're interesting. They're different. Um... They command a lot of attention, right? I think doing... This is probably one of my favorites. I think doing one of them, though, is sufficient. Because I think once you see one, they start to sort of blend in a little bit. And you're like, okay, well, I already saw somebody make a circle and look like you're diving through the landscape. And I get it. Uh, whatever, right? So I'm not super sold on gimmicks like this. But his presentation of the landscape, I think, is very unique. Like, most people don't shoot landscapes in a 360 fashion like this. This is another one of my favorites. I think this is in Sedona, um, Arizona. And then there's drones. You guys, drones have totally changed the face of landscape photography. Is this a landscape? Well, it has a polar bear in it, but yeah, that's a landscape. This is a landscape, right, where they stitch together um, two different seasons of the same shot. Love, love it. Super minimalist, super neg a lot of negative space, gorgeous photo. Uh, I think that's um, Mont Saint Michel, off the coast of France, right? And again, great shot and a great shot. These are all drone shots that are absolutely fantastic. That's a drone shot too, surprisingly. Drones, right? I mean, they're literally changing our angle. Places we never could have photographed, we can photograph now. And then there's this guy. Don't ask me to pronounce his name. We'll call him Aiden. But dude, I love these drone shots. I'm talking about Inception here. If you've ever seen the movie Inception, this feels very Inception-y. It's not a word. But dude, look at the train. I mean, gosh. I love the movement of these. I love how the eye flows through them. I love the composition. I love the interest. I mean, there's there's a freaking visual power in these things. I absolutely love how he bends reality. Like, dude, you would never see this. Ever. So he's showing us a different way to see some of these, these landscapes, right? 
or in dairies, right? I mean, look at this dairy. Looks amazing. So does this drive through? Probably Nevada. It looks like the drive from Nevada to Utah somewhere. But right, I mean, this is this is landscape photography, you guys. It's a very contemporary application of an old old subject matter, right? Looks like those hay bales are going to roll down and smash the house. Santa Rosa. Sea blue hole, 81 feet de deep. Never been there. But even this, right? This sort of urban decay. These urban landscapes that are filled with like our stuff. Our old tech. I mean, super interesting still. Freaking fascinating. All shot with drones, right? Like this is absolutely drone work all day long. You cannot do this without a drone. Then Vincent LaFerre, he started some interesting stuff like in the early 2000s, shooting out of a helicopter and shooting down on cities. And they almost look like circuit boards. Um, he did them really high up and at night. And he often used tilt shift camera lenses to drop focus and only make it in certain places and make really selective focus. Um, his work is very interesting too. It's all shot from the air uh, before drones. This is all shot from like uh, helicopters, which are insanely difficult to shoot out of. I've shot out of helicopters before and they're not, dude, the ones I was in are really bumpy. It's a really bumpy ride. But I mean, this is, I think this is Las Vegas Strip. Um, but absolutely beautiful and stunning, right? And these are aerial landscapes. There's infrared, you guys. And infrared is sort of a new thing that's been... They've shot... Used to shoot infrared film. And infrared film captures only the infrared spectrum of light. It was insanely hard to shoot. You had to keep it in, like, really cold temperatures. Uh, you had to load it in complete darkness. Uh, it was a bummer. All the way around. And with the advent of digital cameras, you could, uh, you could get your camera converted to a infrared camera. And this is color infrared right here. And what they do is all your cameras, cameras and phones, uh, the sensor, the sensors in them are so sensitive to light that they'll actually pick up the infrared spectrum of light too. And they don't want that. And so they put this little filter in it that blocks out infrared light. So it doesn't influence the other light that's used to create your image on your sensor. Well, to get your camera converted, you literally send it somewhere and they just take the little piece of filter out and then now your camera is an infrared camera and it records infrared light like this. The only problem is that it never goes back. Like it will always shoot like this and people look hella strange. Really, really weird. You literally see the veins through their skin. They look gross. Um, but landscapes look great in them, right? I mean, landscapes look absolutely fantastic. Anything that's green, like green grass or green leaves, all looks sort of... Um, feathery and like like feathers and the skies you guys usually usually go sort of jet black here these in these color infrared shots they look very dreamy and ethereal and i mean i don't know of any other like application short of painting that can achieve this sort of effect uh in cameras right with infrared film or infrared technology absolutely freaking beautiful love this stuff puffy clouds feathery leaves Reflected in the water below, like what? Here's another example. It's a black and white version. This is traditionally how they were shot. Um, this is what film looked like. Because black and white, uh, infrared was always black and white, pretty much. It was never color, but with digital, we got color with it. So, But yeah, I mean, I just, I think this is a great, a great way to explore landscape photographies with infrared. It's got this creepy haunting sort of, again, ethereal or next world type of vibe to it. Andy Lee is one of my favorite photographers out here. And when I talked about light and how light creates mood and how we should look for light, this dude is the, again, the like flipping wizard of like finding light in landscapes. I mean, his light in these is absolutely stunning. I, I've never been able, to, I've never shot a shot like this guy. 
and I would love to go, I would love to actually say I've shot something that looks like his work, uh, in sea light like this, but I, dude, I, yeah, haven't yet. Still, still looking for that light. Still hoping for a shot that I see it like this. And I know some is post-production, some is editing, but not all of it. A lot of it is his being at the some place at the at the right time and being patient and waiting and then shooting it. Max Rive is the one of the last guys we're talking about, and Max Rive has been the probably the landscape photographer. The he's won like landscape photographer of the of the world several times in a row. So when it comes to landscapes, this guy knows what he's talking about. Okay. He shoots everywhere. And I remember when I said light, dude, whoa, look at that light. What? Oh my God. Remember when I said scale? Look, he has one little person there standing in the center on that thing. Super cool. Right? Love it. Also, Max tends to mix lenses and focal lengths. Not sure how he does it. Uh, I should have probably looked him up and tried to see if he's given an interview on his process. But, um... He shoots some long lenses, so he zooms in and zooms in and shoots some stuff. And then he shoots other lenses that are more wide angle. And he combines the two in his photos to give sort of an aspect that you'll never probably see in real life. Because your eyes don't trip back and forth between two focal lengths. But look at his work, you guys. I mean, Max is, Max is like freaking king of landscapes man he's so good his light's so good i mean he has i just looked him up a couple days ago for one of my other classes and he does give um he does give tours you can go with him and, and he'll take you out half of it you guys is finding these locations right i mean so that's super important i don't live by anything that looks like this stuff um uh, the other half is sort of knowing when to shoot and what time to shoot at the time of day to shoot waiting for the right light and then the last part's probably processing and editing but um i think his his uh i think his workshops are seven thousand five hundred dollars roughly and then of course you have to fly i think he's in new zealand or somewhere or some one of the sweden or finland or one of those countries up top but his work you guys is like nuts like absolutely beautiful love love looking at it Especially the light in a lot of these. That almost looks like Scotland, dude. Heck, I wish I'd got a shot like that. All the locks. You see all the little lakes? Yeah, they have little locks like that everywhere over there. Everything is wet. There's bogs everywhere. Lakes everywhere. This looks more like a fjord or something. I don't know. This is a place I've never been to. Right? And look at the time of day. Just as the sun's just as the sun's resting, right? Just as it's hitting down, right? Just at sunset, but the sun's not blowing light everywhere, but it is still illuminating the, 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 uh, the surface of the planet. So takeaways from this, you guys, and helping you sort of talk about light a little bit and when to shoot and what to look for. If you're looking for indirect light, you guys, indirect light is more diffused and soft. It has less contrast. You don't have to worry about blowing your highlights out, meaning the whites in your image. And what's great is you can expose the land or the sky and the land easier. You can get both. Second, the sun is out, as you've probably seen. Uh, the sky becomes super bright, right? And there's more contrast in color. Um, it's a little harsher light. It emphasizes color, though, when the sun's at your back. It emphasizes texture, like cross light, when the sun is at 90 degrees to you, right? Or to your left and right. And then it also emphasizes shape and form. Um, like when the silhouette and uh, the sun is behind the subject, right? Because you're looking at the shape and form of a silhouette. Magic hour, you guys, generally is early morning or late evening. And it's like 15 to 30 minutes before sunset and 50 to, 15 to 30 minutes before, uh, oops, before sunrise, right? So these are landscape photography tips for the assignment this week. Um, what you want to do is you want to try to see if you can get your camera to shoot in a raw format, Right. Because again, it'll capture more dynamic range. It'll allow you get the it'll allow you to get the brightest parts of the image, as well as the darkest parts of the image as best it can, and more approximate what your eye sees, which is literally what we want to do. 
we want to preserve the freaking memory of what we saw, right? So what better way than to shoot where we can actually get a better photo of what we actually saw? Time of day, dusk or dawn, think that. We want to use cross light to accentuate texture, and cross light means the sun is either at our left hand side or our right hand side. Uh, we want to use compositional strategies like leading lines and framing and center composition, right? Um, contrast, center of interest. You want to experiment with negative space if you can. Utilize shape and form. Find a point of interest if there is one. And maybe use humans to show scale if you want. Um, but yeah, so next up, you guys, uh, we're going to be talking um, for the assignment and stuff. Just make sure that when you go out... Um, you enjoy it and have fun and just to enjoy the out go out and enjoy outside enjoy the wilderness enjoy the landscape and enjoy the light and have a great shoot this week